when we modernize or contemporize these pieces, um, you know, we see it, we have to see it from the time we're in. We can kind of imagine, but it gets quickly boring if you become a museum piece, yeah? Right. Um, and thankfully, we can look at all those traditional um, stagings that have come before, but um, the mirroring that you can see yourself as an audience member reflected gives you such a visual perspective and it just makes the whole thing bigger. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you to those watching online. Um, as uh, Anne said, this is time for a really important conversation about this piece, which we have been in the midst of for the last uh, two months at San Francisco Opera. The final performance, as Anne said, is tomorrow, and I'm so grateful to be joined by Catherine and Carol and Karen to talk about the piece, about the, the topic of The Handmaid's Tale, the novel, and then this uh, incredible work that has been made out of it in this opera. I'm so proud that we have taken this on at San Francisco Opera. It's probably one of the most challenging things we've had on the stage, certainly in the uh, almost 20 years I've been with the company, and, and a piece that has required the company to go to a very deep and vulnerable place. We may talk about that later if we have time. Um, but it's the kind of piece that reaffirms why the stage matters, why theater, why opera matters in our world as a place for us to gather and be in community around both difficult but also uplifting topics. This happens to be one on the more difficult end of the spectrum, but a place where we can experience, not just watch, but experience these uh, different realities in the world. And I'm just so privileged that we have a company like that here in San Francisco that does it at such a high level. Well, we're going to delve into a number of different themes uh, this evening, and uh, in, in just a minute, uh, Professor Snyder is going to give us a um, overview of the different interpretations of The Handmaid's Tale since the novel. But I thought maybe just to get us started, maybe we could just uh, talk about when your first interaction was with The Handmaid's Tale and, and in what context. Uh, Karen, let's start with you. Um, gosh. Um, I knew about the book, but I chose not to read it for a long time. Uh -huh. And then the series came out. Um, and I watched maybe one episode, and I thought, mm mm, not yet. Uh -huh. And uh, I live my life on the stage, so I'm surrounded by drama all the time. So my free time, I like to kind of not go there. And then the offer from San Francisco Opera came, and I was sort of compelled to do it. But I put it off until the last minute. So I learned the score first. Um, well, learned it was in the process of studying, and I thought, I better read the book now. So I read the libretto, and then I read the book. And then I binged the series in about two weeks, all five. And it was hard, because we were in rehearsal at the same uh -huh. time. So <laughs> just before we got to, I think, the first stage orchestra rehearsal, I finished the series. So I was kind of wrung out. All the seasons? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and my, my husband, who, who doesn't get to travel with me that often, but he was like, what are you doing? Because he, you know, if I'm home, he's happy, and if I'm gone, I'm doing something that he doesn't really know. And so I said, well, I think you'd like this series. And so he binged it also, like, at the same time I was doing it. So we didn't really talk about it yet, but he watched the stream, and he was mesmerized. So. Wow. Now, now he knows what you've been up to. Yeah. <laughs> Carol, how about you? What was your first interaction, and how did you feel? You know, I honestly don't remember when I first read it. I read it close to the time that it came out. Uh -huh. And, um, and it, it felt to me, as much as I can recall, as a piece of purely speculative fiction at uh -huh. that point. Uh -huh. But I reread it in um, preparation for the opera, and I found it chilling. It seemed so much more um, possible in our world that mm -hmm. I remember thinking it was the first time I read it. And Katie, how about you? When, uh, when was your first encounter with Gilead? <laughs> you know, I, I too was thinking, when did this happen? And then I was like, oh, it came out. That was my first year of graduate school. So I think I was reading oh. The Fairy Queen and Shakespeare, uh -huh. and I wasn't paying the least bit of attention. I think I, I certainly read it sooner, but what I associate with it is reading Atwood's 2003 Oryx and Crake, and that's the first novel in a three no mm -hmm. novel uh, post-apocalyptic trilogy that she wrote. And so I think I came back to it around that time. Uh -huh. And it was, you know, it's a very different kind of book, but that, you know, dire dystopian world for me, was always juxtaposed with this post-apocalyptic world, which 
too is dire, but it's also pretty comic in Atwood's treatment of it. So these were, you know, sort of um, the two sides of one coin for uh -huh. me. Well, Katie, you, you have some wonderful slides which you've prepared. And before we jump into some questions, um, it'd be wonderful if you can just give us a context for The Handmaid's Tale and, and the manifestations it's had over the last uh, 40 years or so. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for, for having me. Um, as people have mentioned, there have been numerous adaptations of The Handmaid's Tale since it was published back in 1985. And I think as we'll be discussing, this was a moment in US history with the, the rise of the Christian fundamentalist right that looks all too familiar to us today. Um, and so obviously there's the opera, which was first uh, it premiered in the year 2000 and then it's been done several times and now finally here at the San Francisco Opera. But the, the adaptations of The Handmaid's Tale, and I've got a list here, they include a stage play, actually two stage plays, a movie, a radio play, oh. two audio books, maybe adaptations in their own way, a ballet, a one-woman show, oh. the Hulu TV series, and since the Hulu TV series, just any number of video parodies. There have been Saturday Night oh. Live sketches. Mm -hmm. oh. There have been Brazilian hip hop videos. Oh. There have been Scottish TikToks that all sort and all sorts of other remixes and reuses, mashups in all different genres and formats and platforms. And so I think the, among the questions we would want to ask is, is why, why has this novel been so broadly adapted in so many different media? You know, what is the, the demand? Um, what makes creators so compelled by this work of art, work of fiction? And why is there this sort of endless demand from viewers and listeners and readers for, for this story? What is it that makes, is there something that makes it particularly adaptable? And we can, we can talk about that. What, what are the qualities of this text that make it congenial to adaptation? And then we have the question of, of how. That is, what are these different adaptations in all these different media and genres and format? What do they do with this novel that's both the same and different you know, at different moments in its 40 year history. What does each adaptation emphasize or change, capture, modify, translate? And I think this is particularly um, pointed in part because The Handmaid's Tale is a first person narrated novel set as it turns out, in a narrative frame that's set even further in the future. We have a very psychologically complex protagonist who has very complex, ambivalent relationships with a number of other characters, and some of these relationships are defined by sexual violence. There's a complex mixture of resistance and complicity, all sorts of symbols and metaphors. So what do these different kinds of adaptations do? How are, are some media more suited to, you know, the formal and, and different formal and different thematic aspects of the text are, can a visual text do what a written text does? Can a musical text do what a, um, what a written text does? And I would just say really briefly, and I know I only have a few minutes, that we don't want to make a, mis a couple of mistakes. There are a couple of pitfalls when thinking about adaptations. There 
is often an emphasis on fidelity. You know, is it, does it capture what the novel does? And of course we want, you know, if it didn't capture anything, well then we wouldn't recognize it as an adaptation. And yet to expect it to be purely faithful misses what these texts can do, what these um, adaptations can do. So there's the problem of overemphasizing fidelity at the expense of creativity. And there's also um, the pitfall of insisting on media specificity, saying, well, written text can only, you know, only writing can show psychological complexity, whereas um, visual texts can show, written texts can tell. And we know it doesn't work that way, especially in something like opera, which is both seeing and hearing, and with the um, titles, um, reading, it, it's all of these things. And so, you know, different media have different, you know, powers, but it's, but I think it would be a mistake to say, well, stories, written stories can only tell, visual stories can only show. That's not, um, or what we mean by telling and showing are, um, are complex. So, um, I want to begin. These are some covers of the many, many editions of The Handmaid's Tale um, over the decades. This was from the original um, American publication. This was the original Canadian um, edition. And then these two uh, were from different moments. And, um, and there are many, many more. But I think it gives us a really interesting view of it is a kind of interpretation. I wouldn't necessarily say a cover is a full-scale adaptation, but one picks up this, these, this book and expects very different things from, the, uh, from how it's portrayed on the cover. The first <laughs> adaptation, well, there was a stage play in 1989 at Tufts University. It was a student production, but in 1990, uh, we had this movie that was based on a screenplay by Harold Pinter, and it starred Natasha Richardson, Faye Dunaway, and Robert Duvall. Um, and it, I think you get a sense from looking at the DVD cover of what that <laughs> <laughs> Handmaid's Tale looks like. And it's really hard not to mock this movie. It, it, it's sort of a... Um, it seems to invite it. There are lots of bizarre revisions of the plot. For example, the protagonist, Offred, named Kate in the movie, cuts the throat of the commander and then is unambiguously rescued by the, by the members of the May Day resistance. And in a final vignette, she waits pregnant in the mountains for him to return. You know, so it's this incredibly romantic, sentimental um, drama, but also a kind of action thriller, which is what uh, the director what was intending to do. Uh, then I, we've already mentioned the, uh, the immensely successful Hulu TV series. And you can see a very different Offred um, in this uh, picture of Elizabeth Moss, who is, has her characteristic glower that we see throughout the seasons that have been aired. And there's one more season to go. The, um, the TV series aired at the same time that Trump took office, it had already been in the works, but it was a context in which it absolutely vibrated with the concerns of the nation uh, as well as internationally. It, 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 the series shot the novel back up onto the bestseller list, and it 
popularized the, the handmaid's garb as it came to be used in public protests all over the world. And I'll show you a picture or two of that. I could say lots of things about the series, and I imagine that, um, that some of you have seen it. But for the sake of time, I'll move forward uh, and just show you images uh, from the ballet, which was in 2013. And there was a one-woman show in 2015. Um, Where was the ballet? Do you, do you know? Win well, the first ballet was in Winnipeg, okay. Canadian. Uh -huh. And then there have been other, mm -hmm. other ones. Um, and then I also wanted to show you, uh, in the spring of 2019, uh, there was a graphic novel of The Handmaid's Tale. And this came out just a couple months before Atwood's sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, The Testament. So it was sort of part of a big publicity um, moment. And I just wanted to show you a couple images. I think the graphic novel is wonderful. And you can see the range of representational um, modes here with high you know perspective with the, you know the slashing style with the um, scrabble board um, I think one gets all sorts of things in this image and text mode that we don't see in other genres the next thing I wanted to show you is I picked out a scene uh, from the novel in which Janine is testifying her sins and being made an example of at the Red Center. And this is a scene that we see in the movie and in the TV show, as well as in uh, the graphic novel. And there are you know, important differences in the, um, the relationships among the characters, the visuals, and so so on. And I also wanted to throw in um, this scene, <laughs> which may be familiar to you, another scene at the Red Center. Um, and then, as I mentioned, and as I'm sure you remember, the during the Trump presidency, during the popularity, you know, the explosion of uh, publicity associated with the TV series, The Handmaid's Garb came to be a sort of symbol of protest, and particularly for protests around women's reproductive rights. And so these are from very, this was from the Brett Kavanaugh hearings in, uh, on the left in Washington, up uh, on the right, a protest about the separation of immigrant children from their parents at the border, uh, Argentina, Dublin, Philadelphia, and so on. And then finally, and this is my last slide, the handmaid's garb, the red robe, and the white bonnet or the white wings are back. This is from 20. 22, and with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, there is a new, a new salience, a new urgency to what The Handmaid has to tell us. And so I would just end by saying that this novel and its many adaptations have warned us time and time again that it could happen here. Thank you so much, Katie. This sure. Whoops. Great to Turn see the, the arc of this over a 40 year period. And I, I have always been surprised by Margaret Atwood's willingness to let the piece have, let the novel have all these different futures. And I don't know how the uh, process went for the other iterations, but I know from the opera, she really didn't have, she gave her blessing to it and then stood back and let them, let them take it on. Um, and I think for something that is so iconic or has become so iconic, uh, it's, it's a great testament to her that she's willing to let it go out in the world in different ways. And I, I wanted to just stay with 
adaptation for a moment and ask you, Karen, as we think about what the operatic version brings to it, and particularly the idea of dystopia. And as you said, Katie, there's each of these different art forms brings something different. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how Paul Ruders, who's a, the Danish composer of this, how does he convey dystopia uh, <laughs> through this mighty score of which uh, we have right in front of us here? Well, from the first chord, you know everything's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, he uses a bit of polytonality. Um, a lot of chord clusters, and I noticed that in the in the Hulu TV series, I'm sure the composers, I'm sure there are more, um, took some influence from this score because it's kind of in the same style. And I was watching it, going, "Uh huh, yeah, <laughs> that sounds like our scene in this." So, um, and it's it's good. It's kind of Hitchcockian. Um, also, no one is truly comfortable in the world that they're in in the opera because there's always an underlying, okay, the rituals are very rhythmic and you can feel a pulse and it's, you know, they're being bullied and bashed into something. And those are, oddly enough, the most tonal moments are the ones that are the most brutal. And um, the dissonances and the lack of a, a discernible pulse in certain things where the vocal lines are very difficult, but they're not lyrical, they're prosaic. Um, so they're declaiming a lot of the time. Um, then the few melodies that there are are moments of heartbreak, like in the duet or in her last, or her first aria and her last aria when she gets very private and poetic. Um, but the rest of it is very unsettling. There are instruments that shadow um, the, the voices so that they have some pitch orientation when there's a lack of tonality or multi-tonalities like F major chord against an E minor chord and, and these mixtures which are tonal moments but when they're layered on top of each other it's very disorienting and it's diffuse and we lose our balance and it's very uncomfortable and it makes one a bit dizzy because sound waves have emotional effects on people and all composers know that. That's historically proven and if you go into the sound wave theories which is far too complicated for me, but I know about it. And I know that sonorities have an effect on me emotionally and I have to breathe and breathe through it, breathe, breathe, expel, expel, hold, hold, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And so I think it's mesmerizing because you're unsettled and then you find relief when the ritual begins and you can settle into some kind of stable heartbeat. And that's what makes it for me just almost, I'm, I'm often, I have to be a kind of method actor conductor to not be nauseated by it. Um, and that's what's made it so unsettling for us. It's a, it's a unique tonal language, like you know it's Paul's music. He writes a lot in this style. He's a bit minimalistic. Um, and there's also, this is very Hitchcockian also, there's often a high-pitched, scratchy something going on mm -hmm. in the background, or we have a sampler that's grumbling and it has some distortion in it. It's because no one's okay, and he doesn't really want you to be comfortable with this, so it keeps you kind of distressed and thinking the whole time. So the, um, talking about the sampler, so there are, there are electronic elements that go through this. Correct and a little bit of amplification, right, but just Correct. judiciously used. Yes, um, I think it was always uh, conceptualized to be lightly enhanced. It is a very thick orchestration, and when you have clusters, um, it just builds sound, it builds resonance and a human voice. It's hard to cut, especially if they're in a lower kind of um, tessitura or level of, of intonating. Um, and then, of course, there's all the stuff backstage, so when you have dialogue that's over music that needs to be amplified and you have stuff backstage that needs to be amplified anyway and you have electronic instruments and a whole half pit battery of percussion you have to mm -hmm. enhance everyone there's just just to have the the sound palette that you need to have it be a fulfilling auditory experience so we have a sound designer at the back of the orchestra level who is real time um sort of mixing and just blending the voices. He, he knows what's coming. He's reading, following the score and uh, helping just to give that context, but to keep it as naturalistic as possible. One of my friends who um, was at the performance yesterday, he'd never been to the opera. Um, even though he's my friend, he'd never been to the opera. Um, and he has played acoustic guitar and electric guitar and all this stuff. And he went up to our sound designer. He said, 
great concept. And <laughs> and Richard was so, or Fred, Fred was so, Rick. Rick. I Rick. have so many. Um, Rick was so chuffed. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> you noticed. <laughs> so good. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an important job because you know, so much is going through that one person. And, uh, oh my gosh. He has, he has to honor the intent of you, of the singers, and make sure that the uh, what the audience then hears. I mean, the audience is getting a lot of acoustic as well, but uh, he, he has the power mm. to do uh, a lot of good and a lot of damage. Mm. So, mm. But he does. Me too. He's, he's a <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about the physicality of the score, Karen, before we yeah, move on. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to hold it up so that the, uh, the audience online can see this. In relation. But wait, it's funnier if I pick it up because I've been carrying this thing. <laughs> I've been carrying this thing for months, right? And this is only so, Act Two, so Act yeah. One is uh, even bigger. So they're huge. But tell, tell us about this in comparison to a regular opera score. Well, it's quite possible that I have one that's bigger, but it's not hard bound, so it's not as as you know tough to carry around. The two of them together weigh about thirty pounds, so I feel like I've been you know been carrying my cross these weeks. And you, you had this specially enlarged, right? I did not. Oh, I was looking for one because I, I purchased the normal one, which is just a normal, I don't know, what are those in, in US? Uh -huh. uh, 14 by whatever, 18, you know, like that. And I had it on the floor and it's an infamous picture now going around the theater because I put the, the little one on top of this one and then my dog sat on it. <laughs> and so I took a photo and I was like, you know, he's smaller than the big score. So. I happen, it happened to be playing in London in a different um, staging when I was in London. And so I went to the English National Opera and talked to the librarian and I said, um, is Joanna Carnero, is she using a bigger score? And he said, no, she's using the little one. And I was like, I can't do it because I opened it and I cried because I'm like, I can't, it's microscopic. And I said, do you have a bigger one or could you make me a bigger one before I approached uh, yeah. you guys? Mm -hmm. And he said, we have this heavy thing in the corner. <laughs> you can have it if you transport it. And so I took it. <laughs> and we, had wow. to have, we had to have a special music stand made so that it could fit on. It's, uh, it, is, it is such <laughs> for a... The, for the, yeah, the one in the pit is fine, but for the piano rehearsal. So I'll leave it here afterwards. Anyone wants to peek through it, just don't tear any pages out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carol, I wanted to ask you, uh, stay on this uh, topic of dystopia, and you know, I think in, in Katie's presentation, we saw you know, the changing use of The Handmaid's Tale to interpret dystopia, and I just want, you were, you were chancellor at UC Berkeley as we went through the pandemic, um, which was a moment where you know, we, we began to sort of see glimpses of what it might like to be in a dystopia. We're all quickly shut, shut away at home. I think about that day in September of 2020 when the sky, skies turned orange yeah. while we were locked away at home. We began to sort of feel it, not just read about it. And I'm just curious, coming out of that, did the issue of dystopia begin to affect research topics at the university? Did the academic community sort of um, start interpreting that or bring that into their own thinking? And were there, were there any sort of interesting pathways that you saw academically coming out of that? Yeah, well, that's such an interesting question. I think it's in the nature of faculty to recognize what the a catastrophic, the existential threat is, and try to fix it. Mm -hmm. So you immediately had faculty turning their research, for example, to COVID, or um, turning their research to wildfire. So it wasn't what you, you know professors of English might think. Oh my God, let's think about dystopia. Why are people writing all these dystopian novels? What is it saying about the world in which we live? I think a lot of our faculty's research in scientific fields was very much, let's go solve these problems, mm -hmm. rather than um, thinking, oh my god, th the world is lost and we're watching its destruction. So you, you saw that relationship more in the sciences than in the humanities? Yes, yes. I, I taught a class on pandemic fiction. Yeah, sure. Oh. I was just going <laughs> to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Here for the humanities, but yeah, yeah, it confirms what you just said. Well, and and how did you, how did you take that and run with that in that class, Katie? Well, it it because well, I did it be, because I couldn't think about anything else. Uh -huh. uh, but there was you know there's a history to pandemic writing from you know Journal of the Plague Year. Mm -hmm. We read Angels in America mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. concerning the AIDS epidemic and looked at different different genres of writing as well as um, video and so on. Um, so trying to 
have the students see it in a historical perspective mm -hmm. as well as in aesthetic terms yeah. too. Mm -hmm. How does how do people represent this kind of unrepresentable um, catastrophe? Right. What's fascinating to me is how many um, books that are being published currently are dystopian. You just read any, you know, sort of weekly edition of the New York Times Book Review and you'll find some dystopian novels there. Mm. And they have a certain kind of form which is interesting in relationship to The Handmaid's Tale. Do you think that that has changed um, through the pandemic, the, the, the very form of, of sort of dystopian novels, Carol? Um, it, it, well, the nature of this pandemic, yes and no. I mean, you you know, you have people retreating to country houses mm -hmm. um, uh, to um, tell stories to each other, uh, um, but um, like the Tehameron, but 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 not so much. What's interesting to me to get to the Handmaid's Tale um, about dystopian fiction generally is there's always a very important role that memory plays in it. Mm -hmm. that um, you have to find a way of um, going back and imagining an alternative world, mm -hmm. and it tends to be located in memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's something to play off. Yeah. yeah. Which, of course, is, is very much a part of the opera because you have this entire other version of Offred, which is happening in flashback. real time and flashbacks, and, mm -hmm. and this production is happening, you know, with a, with a glass wall that has this sort of memory space upstage of the uh, mm -hmm. playing space as well, mm -hmm. in, in a very fragmented way. Mm -hmm. um, um, Katie, I'm curious, just um, staying with sort of dystopian fiction and maybe some of the hallmarks of it. The images you had at the end there of people in uh, in protest um, interpretations of the handmaid's costume, that's how our production of it ends. As, as those of you who have seen it know, um, the entire chorus come out in street clothes with the with the um, sort of handmade red capes as opposed to the actual handmaid's costumes, um, and they hold up this sign saying "In Hope" at the end. How much is how much is hope a critical part of dystopian fiction? How much do we need to see a way out of dystopia? And how, how much of the, of the dystopian fiction gives us that way out? I would say that, well, it varies. But I would say that it partly depends on the reader, on what you come to dystopian fiction looking for mm -hmm. and and you know carol was just saying it's it's everywhere and and it has been for a long time but certainly there's been this proliferation of both television film and fiction about dystopia about apocalyptic fiction and you know, often people ask me, like, well, why, why do people, why do you like this stuff? And, um, and it's complex, right? Um, there is some sort of um, sense of reassurance. It can't happen here, and yet it's increasingly happening here, so it is terrifying. There's a sense of the horror and fear as a kind of pleasure, which is very perverse, right? Like, why do we enjoy mm -hmm. these, you know, horrifying political, uh, physical representations? And just to get back to what you were asking about hope, um, I think that it's as much what we bring to it. Some text, some performances, mm -hmm. you know, put hope right up there. But it depends on what you do when you walk out of the theater or when you close the book. Um, Margaret Atwood coined this term, which is us-topia. And, she's, and uh -huh. she said it was a mashup of utopia and dystopia. Mm. And because she says there is 
a little bit of utopia in every dystopia and a little bit of dystopia in every utopia. And it's part of being able to imagine an alternative. And it goes both ways. So um, yeah, I think we have to look for the utopia and dystopia and also see uh, the dystopia. What is it that the commander says in The Handmaid's Tale? He says, I won't be able to quote this verbatim, but something about how better is never better for everyone. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. It's really, I, I, there was a period a few years ago where I was reading lots of dystopian novels, and I noticed there's a pattern in a lot of them where they end with a new Adam and a new Eve embarking mm. mm -hmm. on some new world. And you kind of get that mm. at the end of the opera. But I loved what you said about um, everybody's unhappy with the, in the opera. The mm -hmm. commander's unhappy, the commander's wife is unhappy, obviously all the handmaids are mm -hmm. unhappy. And the only happiness you can glimpse are, is in the past mm -hmm. or in the kind of hope, spectral hope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or the moments that she steals with Nick, but that's also at a yeah. great cost. Yeah. So. Um, those moments of of sort of consonance in in the Handmaid's Tale, and I just want to say I think the the operatic version allows us into thing into characters like the wife, the commander's wife, in really interesting ways because we see this is a woman. Yes, she has a power that Offred doesn't, mm -hmm. but you feel in in the music that she has that she has no more agency than Offred, and and it's yeah. you you really feel the mm -hmm. complete lack of any agency, um, particularly for the women in the Handmaid's Tale, and I think that the music really underscores that. Um, but these moments of, of consonance, of memory, of hope, uh, are sort of really interestingly done. And they're done in, in the opera with a sort of pastiche lens, both through mm -hmm. Amazing Grace, but also with moments of Bach and, and other, another work from the Baroque as well. How, how would you say that Powell uses that, the, comp the composer Powell Ruders, Karen, in, in the score? And can you give us a sort of sense uses of... uses what exactly? Uh, sort of the, this pastiche from the past and... Ah, well, I was just, I got sidetracked with something you said because I hadn't thought of it myself until this moment that the flashback scenes are all in 6-8, so yum bum 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 But most of Serena Joy's music is also in 6-8, mm -hmm. even though she's in the present, so that must be that she's struggling because she was a, a gospel singer in the time before. And so the scene where it's the mashup, which where you've seen her singing Amazing Grace in one key, slightly off from the regular rhythm that we have, so uh -huh. just like a half a beat or one and a half beats off, so you're like mm -hmm. um, The different key and then this kind of minimalistic repetitive pattern um, that's kind of just beating a constant beat. But it can hardly be done unless we're on a click track. Like it was conceptualized to be on a click track. So me and 16 other players have a click track in their ear so that we're synchronized. And can you just explain click track, Karen, and what? Uh... Where's my phone? Um, a metronome, <laughs> duck, duck, duck. So I created a system that would work for me so that I understood it um, to synchronize with the film. And this is common for, um, for, for film in general. It's the only way to do it because as much of a metronome as I am, um, you still tend to phrase, like the human beings, we like to be in, in groups of four <laughs> or two. So one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, one. You know, and even three, if you do a waltz, one, two, three, that's still comfortable. Um, but if there's any fluctuation to that, we tend to just surge a little bit forward and try to phrase it. But if you're trying to synchronize to something, you can't. So that just takes the pressure off. I don't think I could do it without a click track. And I'm pretty good rhythmically. Yeah. Yeah, one of the most interesting things I found both dramatically and musically about the opera is religion. A religion is so complex. It's both parody, but it's also something that the handmaid is groping toward at the mm. end. And religious music keeps coming in in really interesting yeah, and my, sometimes parodic ways. My mom who read the book, she's 82, and um, she read the book, um, and then she watched the stream and she needed to take it in steps. She couldn't watch the whole thing. She has not watched the series. and. Um, she she has a hard time with it, and she she's um, 
she says it touched her, it, it, like she was ungrounded when she was listening to it. And she said, I can't believe he used Amazing Grace. I don't think I can listen to that song anymore. Mm -hmm. The M song. They did use it in the movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I told you. I wonder who's getting credits for that. Let, let's take a quick listen. Uh, we're gonna, we'll listen to uh, a use of the Amazing Grace. This is in the, the what they call the ceremony scene, which is the the sort of ritual impregnation moment, which is a very, very hard oh. moment on, on stage. Um, and then again, as you, as you say, the amazing grace sort of starts coming in in this very um, sort of subversive way. But can we maybe just listen to that, uh, that track? Oh, sorry, the next, the next ceremony one. So this is where the polytonality is. You'll hear the minimalistic stuff under, no, yes, yes. No, this is the classroom. Yeah. It was the trailer. Oh yes, the trailer, sorry, thank you. Yeah, the trailer. comes in and out is yeah so um when you're a half step apart it's very disorienting and your ear will go towards tonality so you will automatically recognize it and then he uses a lot of what we call glissandi bending pitches um where the violins will just go and which is just like when when you can't take it anymore and it happens a lot this kind of seasickness queasiness emotional queasiness when i i think you said something about the you know, you get to these moments and suddenly you feel comfortable because now you're hearing something tonal and that you recognize, right? When the most uncomfortable thing is happening on stage and it comes back to that kind of complete um, unsettlingness of the score where, mm. again, you, you can be watching something that is horrific and then you're hearing music that is finally tonal and that, that's... And uh, I told the orchestra and the chorus, attach zero emotion to it because if we emote, if we vibrate on a note, if we warm up anything, it destroys the effect of being shattering. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's just listen to one other moment. This is the duet in act two between Offred and her former self, and mm -hmm. Karen, maybe you can set up what this is and, and sort of how, how it's used in the score. Um, well, it's one of the most moving moments, also one of the most heartbreaking, where um, the two characters playing themselves <laughs> against themselves meet, um, and they sing the same text. And we have two beautiful singers whose voices blend beautifully, and it's about three minutes worth of music basically, but we worked like four hours on it to get them to enunciate and to color and to find a shading and to trust each other, to do it basically on their own. I'm not, I'm doing a little bit of conducting of them, but they're owning the scene and it's heartbreaking because you can hardly tell who's singing. And that was my intention because I'd heard other recordings where I was like, Mm, 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 mm. And when I saw it in London, they did a pretty good job, but I was like, I know we can do better. I know we can do better. And I think we did. And that's what's so heartbreaking. It's super simple. Um, the text is beautiful in such a nasty, debilitating way. This is awful. Let's take a listen to the duet. Sometimes. 
was that high pitched? Then they break into the reality, each of their own realities, and then they meld back again. So they have these, these bursts, um, and I'm kind of out of the timeline because I'm so in it, but this is the moment where um, the Offred double has just been captured, and she's, she's in this new situation, and she's reminiscing, and she doesn't know where her daughter is. And it's right after um, Serena Joy shows her the photo as bribery for good behavior, and they come together on this bed, and, and it takes you a second to realize, like, they're kind of ghosts talking to mm -hmm. each other. It's yeah. horrible. It's such a remarkable example. I'm thinking about the sort of idea of like, oh, only in, in written text can we understand the complexity of this first person perspective mm -hmm. and memory. And it's, it's just such a wonderful demonstration mm -hmm. of that complexity of her me memory, of her relationship to the past and to the present. Mm -hmm that you know is in no way like just a kind of imitation of the novel it's its whole own thing and yet is evoke you know it's both um referring to the novel and and being its own unique yeah. uh, representation of psychology and relationship yeah, I thought that was one of the most brilliant things about the opera is taking what in the novel are the memories of, of Fred and making it into a separate character. It's, it's yeah, amazing. the high-pitched um, things for me was always like the voice of consciousness, like everybody, like someone who's got, you know how you, you have the inner critic that talks to you all the time, or as you're doing one thing, you're multitasking in your head, and that's just that discomfort of like, how did I land in this situation? Or I think it's very personal for each character. I don't know if the bad ones reflect, I can't tell, but for me, when it appears, I'm like, oh, there's something there's another layer in the subconscious because I like Hitchcock used that like <laughs> we get a lot of that too. When I think it's it's a it's a helpful reminder of scenes like that that this this piece this book is is about someone's journey through you know a, a sort of a living hell hmm. and but someone with feelings with um, with a sense of consciousness about the world around them hmm. and and I do think the opera opens that. In a deeper way than you can in, in, a, in a, just a text, it's because yeah. yeah. it's it's an emotional journey that she's mm. having to take and, and grapple with. Um, mm. And then Margaret Atwood's reminder that nothing in this book hasn't happened. So in real life, so we know there are many, many, many people who are going through some version of this. And there's a great humanizingness, I think, mm. with that duet. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if we have any questions from the audience, so I wanna make sure we, uh, we save a few minutes for those. But while we, while we get those, Karen, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what it meant for the company, for, for you, for the cast, to go through this, because this is not like doing Bohem. This is a, a work of you know, profound emotion. Mm. Bohem has plenty of profound emotion in two, but this is Yeah, we don't disrespect any opera because opera rarely has a happy ending. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but this requires something quite unique, I think, of, of the people who are spending literally two months in this, in this topic day in, day out. What was that like for you and what was it like for the cast, do <sighs> you think? Yeah, um, I think it's a huge challenge musically for everybody, without exception. Um, a stylized piece like this um, with subject matter that we all know. Um, difficult, difficult text and difficult intervals for them to learn. So, you know, when you come together and you build a new family over two months, maybe you know some of your colleagues, a few of them, but m sometimes we're all new. We had some connections in this one already, so you build a safe space pretty quickly because you realize everyone's nervous. And so for the first week, we were all terribly nervous. Mm -hmm. I think, do, are we going to get it right? What is she going to ask of me? The pianists were nervous. The prompter was nervous. I was nervous. I'm doing it for the first time. And we were all doing it for the first time, except Nate, the pianist. He'd done it before in Boston. And um, it grew that you know we had to 
get into it pretty quickly. The rehearsal period was not that long. Mm -hmm. um, basically three weeks until we got on stage. And we had an intimacy director for the difficult scenes. Those were often done with the, the singers, actors in private before they let the rest of the team in so they could work out their stuff. Many people have had experiences in their lives that are, that are mirrored in this um, piece, so there were some triggers going on. There was some coaching and therapy offered to us. Many of us have coaches and therapists as well, so we were using them. Um, we went out a lot, which is not always the case when you do an opera, but we needed that time after those rehearsals to kind of decompress together and just laugh together because there's no laughter in this piece except for the scene where they're chasing their kid <laughs> in flashback, yeah? And then they really let it rip in those. But other, other than that, you can tell there's a heaviness in the room and we try to lighten it as much as possible. Like the thing in Hope, we were at the stage rehearsals and they were trying to figure out who's gonna be placed where you know, in hope, each letter, they held it up. And in the streaming, my mom didn't see the O because it was kind of um, dark. So she's like, what is I-N-H-P-E? And I, I just, I lost it. And so when we were doing it the first time, my assistant said, I wonder if they're going to spell iPhone, like mess it up and spell iPhone. And that's, yeah, and Bob. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of humor we were using to get through our days, you know? And like, usually when I go to singers in their dressing rooms, I'm like, you know, have fun tonight. You can't say that with this piece. You know, so I'm like, well, have a good show. And I told them at the last rehearsal before the dress rehearsal, because the dress rehearsal was with public, so I couldn't really speak to the company as a whole. So the pre-dress rehearsal, I just said, guys, you know me now for about a month. Um, I'm really smiley, but I can't smile at you. I can't encourage the mm. kind of lightness. So I had to find different ways, different eye contact to give them hope during this. And I asked the chorus even to slim down their sound and not be all operatic, but to be kind of these people who have been beaten into submission to to go in one um, dictatorial direction or authoritarian theocracy, you know, all of that stuff. Um, it's been one of the heaviest. I've done a lot of crazy pieces with, I mean, crazy stories, but this is the one that has been consistently um, breathtaking, not in the good way for me. Like it takes my air and I'm, I'm seeking air. And I, musicians usually have to prepare for the next gig while, when, as soon as they mm -hmm. mount the gig, then they have days in between and they study other things. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't concentrate on anything mm -hmm. else but this monster right there. And Irene, the, the lead, she's been singing other things just to, you know, they do sing other things because their instrument is in their body and my instrument is here. But I can't, in order to be calming for everyone else and so that they feel secure that I'll catch them no matter what happens and support them and look them in the eyes so that if they're getting emotional on stage, they can collect themselves and they can breathe. It's cost me more than any production I've ever done. And I've done... 65 operas. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for going there, Carol, It's not fun, it's, but it is very honorable work. No, it's, yeah. Well, and it, if, if the vulnerability does not happen in the pit and on the stage, then we don't receive it with mm. that vulnerability either. So I, I have huge admiration and gratitude for you and for the cast for It goes for the orchestra that. as well. You know, they look up and, and it's a very difficult score and the sound <clears> world in the pit is also kind of like, and it affects us. So I think we're all just a little extra tired mm -hmm. and probably not understanding why. And I think it's the science of sound. <laughs> right, frankly. I think you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Carol and Katie, in, in the academic context, again, I think in the opera world, we are trying to do better in terms of creating safe spaces to create art and to be, to have the, you know, the realization that the creation of art takes a toll on the creators and it's not just something which you do as a job and, you know, clock out at the end of the day and, and don't think about it again. As, as academia is grappling with plenty of complex and difficult subjects, is there a move or has there been a move in academia to sort of create safe spaces for conversation and is there a sort of analogy in the university context? I, that's a complicated yeah. question <laughs> um, because there's been a, 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 a movement that I think has been rightly parodied, uh -huh. uh, you know, trigger warnings and safe spaces. But if, if um, great works of literature don't get you at your very core, mm -hmm. I, What's the They're point? They're not succeeding. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the point of them, just as yeah. it's the point of music. Right. Absolutely. What she said. <laughs>
<laughs> um, a couple of notes from from the audience. Uh, someone, uh, an interesting um, perspective in terms of the layering of uh, of the Handmaid's Tale in, in the theatre. Um, someone saying that you know they had these moments several times in the opera where they had three perspectives. They were seeing Alfred in Gilead, Alfred in the time before, and with the plexiglass they were seeing you, Karen. Uh, oh right, yeah, in, I heard that. The, but not if you're on the floor. If you're up, <laughs> right, then you, you go a little yeah. further up. And any time you have glass or any kind of reflective surface on stage, there'll be somewhere in the house where you can see uh, different perspectives. Um, so it's just sort of an interesting. Idea it's also, that also, it's also the, uh, many directors use it for depending on what. It's a great theatrical device also because, you know, theater is supposed to be contemporary. Um, sometimes you'll hear that in opera, I don't want to see my real life reflected because I want to go relax in the opera. Well, it wasn't relaxing for them back in the day. It was, it was like actual commentary mm -hmm. on society of the time. So we reflect back on that. But when we modernize or contemporize these pieces, um, you know, we see a we have to see it from the time we're in. We can kind of imagine, but it gets quickly boring if you become a museum piece, yeah? Right. Um, and thankfully, we can look at all those traditional um, stagings that have come before, but um, the mirroring that you can see yourself as an audience member reflected gives you such a visual perspective, and it just makes the whole thing bigger, yeah, I think. It really does. I, I like to think if we're doing our job, then you, the audience, feel as though you're on stage in the middle of the drama. Mm. Mm. O opera is a participatory sport, not an observational sport, I think. Mm. Um, and then the last question uh, from the audience here, how is the audience responding? Um, Katie, Carol, as, as audience members who have seen this, I'm intrigued by what your sense was sort of coming out of the theater and how was your sense of the audience reaction? Well, I thought it was amazing, powerful, and I thought many of the people mm -hmm. around me thought that too. I mean, it's hard to generalize about an opera house that big. Yeah. Katie? What she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was overwhelming. And, and I say that as someone who doesn't know much about opera, but to be in that, you know, giant space with that giant sound and, um, you know, to have it wash over you <clears throat> is both remarkable and painful. Mm -hmm. I'll just read, we were talking backstage, I'll just reiterate, um, I've just lost the thought because I'm very emotional about this. <laughs> audience reactions. Audience reactions. Audience reactions. Yeah, I was, I was struck. Um, I, I found some parts of the opera more graphic, harder to watch than I found reading the novel. Right. I know what it is. That when you read the book, you can put it down when it gets uncomfortable. Oh, yes. <laughs> and when you watch the TV series, you're like, I need a beer now. Click out of here I can watch tomorrow when you're in the opera we're in it and we tell the story that took okay so the opera is basically the whole first season so that's 10 episodes I think there were mm -hmm. you know and we tell it with that intensity with that arc and that peak in two hours I would prefer to do it without a break because I think it would be even more shattering but it would be really long yeah um, so it's it, I wouldn't say it's hard to get back into it but I think it would be even more effective if we did it without a break, because it could be done like that. Um, so that's true. why it's so shattering, is because you just don't get a break. Yeah. 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 And, and Karen, your perspective for the audience, just before we wrap, because um, you, you have a unique place in that you are feeling the audience behind you. How do you feel the audience in a different way behind you than you um, would in a different opera? How can I say this? I don't feel them in this one. I uh -huh. think it is so silent. Yeah. It is so silent yeah. um, that I, I feel some shifting and some laughter in these few uncomfortable places with a couple of lines of text. Um, but other than that, I feel maybe it's respect for the subject matter or fear of the subject matter, but it seems really... You can hear a pen drop. Come early and often, and here's to the handmaid's tale. Thank you. Thank you.